Hi, this is Dr. Wallace J. Nichols. This next episode is an interview between my collaborator, filmmaker Sarah Sheehan, and my dear friend, Celine Cousteau. She's the granddaughter of legendary Jacques Cousteau, and they talk about how each one of us can play a part in protecting and restoring our lakes, rivers, and oceans. You're gonna love this conversation. Let's check it out. I'm Celine Cousteau. Um, I'm an activist, both for environmental and humanitarian uh, causes. And I do that through documentary films, storytelling, lectures, jewelry design, however I can. I come from a family um, of ocean explorers. My grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, um, in the early 50s was out in the world starting to film the underwater world. My father traveled with him for decades. My mother was an expedition photographer for 13 years. And uh, my grandmother was aboard my grandfather's ship more often than anybody in my family. So ocean exploration has just been a part of my lineage. We've moved from just ocean exploration to ocean protection because over the course of these two, three generations of my family working on ocean issues, we know now that ocean exploration isn't enough. We need to understand and protect. What I've seen over the course of time, of my own lifetime, there's been an increase in pollution in the oceans, um, increase in overfishing, unsustainable practices, um, slave labor when it comes to the high seas and fishing in the high seas where there are there's no governance. We can keep going, it can keep adding up and get a bit overwhelming. The good thing I've seen is that people are now reacting, is that there is enough information out there. We are being more effective at sharing that information, either through documentary films, through just information into the public, that people are starting to understand that there are dire situations that we are responsible for. Plastic pollution is maybe one of the most prominent, obvious ones that is out right now that people are paying attention to, but we've known for a long time that it's an issue. My hope is that people react before it's too late, and that means that you have to react today, and you have to do something positive. I met a glaciologist years ago, Lonnie Thompson, and uh, we were studying the Calcaya ice cap in Peru, and I asked him, I said, do you think that, um, do you think we're gonna react in time when it comes to climate change and melting of ice caps? And he said something that I think is relevant for this subject as well. He said, unfortunately, human beings don't react until their backs up are against the wall. And when it comes to something as big as climate change, that's too late. So connecting people back to the oceans and the importance of the oceans in all of our lives is essential. Why are the oceans so important? Well, the ocean produces half the oxygen we breathe. I like to start with that because no matter where you are on the planet, I think people enjoy breathing. And if you think every other breath is the ocean and every second breath comes from plants, then you realize we are completely dependent on these ecosystems being healthy. If the ocean ecosystem isn't healthy, it comes back to us. If there's too much plastic in the ocean, it gets into the fish, it bioaccumulates up the food chain, and it comes back onto our plate. If we are not regulating fishing practices and we don't know what fish we're buying, even if we try to eat sustainable fish or low on the food chain to avoid the bioaccumulation of mercury or plastics, well, if we don't know what that fish is because we're not tracing it from the point of extraction to our plate, then we may also be eating more contaminants. To think we're not connected with the oceans, for me, is, is, um, is unthinkable. Because it's just, it's there. It's 70% of our planet. It's the air that we breathe. It's the food that we eat. It's what we swim in. So how can we not understand that we're connected to it? It's also a huge part of what makes up our human body. Yeah. It's water. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it almost feels like there's a biological pull. It's hard for people who are perhaps um, either landlocked or unable to get to oceans to feel that directly. I think instinctually it's there. But I know a lot of people that, that don't ever spend time in the oceans. And it always seems like it's over there. And even people who do, you go by the waterfront and you just see the surface of the ocean. And it's on a beautiful sunny day. It's always shiny. And it looks fine. Making it more obvious is necessary. So what steps can people take, like the average person? What can the average person do? Well, I'd say on a daily basis to stop the use of single-use plastics, to eat only sustainable seafood that you know the origin of, or stop eating it one at a time. I don't tell people not to eat any seafood. I say, if you're someone who eats seafood, maybe look at eliminating one unsustainable um, element at a time. Support organizations that are defending oceans, protecting our shorelines, protecting small-scale fishermen, um, cleaning up oceans, reducing waste, 
there are defenders, there are warriors out there that are doing an amazing job working on ocean issues. We don't all need to be out there doing it. So I would say for the person who is the um, maybe more the, the couch side ocean defender, that has tremendous value too. And you know, you talk about ocean warriors, we're working with an organization called Force Blue, which mm. takes former combat veterans and uses them on um, marine conservation missions, yeah. redeploys them. Um, they're planted coral, um, they were in Puerto Rico for um, months helping to restore the coral reef mm -hmm. there that got decimated in Hurricane Maria. Um, can you talk about that, an organization like that and why that's important? There's a great organization based in Mexico called the Mesoamerican Reef Leadership Program. They do tremendous work every year. They have about 12 fellows, marine biologists, conservationists, scientists who are doing great work on the Mesoamerican reef system, but who perhaps don't have all the skills necessary to do better. So they teach them grant writing, uh, presentation skills, outreach, communications, PR, all of that. Um, there's one woman in particular I, I just I love to support. She's a phenomenal human being, Gabriela Nava. Um, she's based in Mexico and she does coral planting projects um, off the coast of Quintana Roo. She has been studying, I think it's the staghorn coral, and seeing the resistance of the staghorn to climate change, changes in temperature of the oceans and acidity. And so she is trying to replant essentially the coral reef system. And there's, there's m so many more examples of people like that. And I think that um, to be able to meet them in person for me is inspiring. It's energizing and motivating to know that they're out there uh, doing the, the work that they're doing gives me hope and faith that we will succeed in protecting our ocean ecosystems. But we all need to do our part. So I try to spread the word as much as I can about the work um, that people like uh, Gabby are doing, Mesoamerican Reef Leadership Program, just as an example. Wow. And um, you have worked with Jay Nichols, yes? Yes. Tell me about Jay. Um, Jay is one of those people who is so passionate and focused on, um, on what he does, what he believes in. He's incredibly engaging, and um, I think he is one of those examples of people who dedicates his life to something because his heart and soul is in it. And I think he's, he's making great change in the world. You know, your family's legacy is the water. Mm. Um, you're sort of connected to the water. Tell me why, you know, something like Blue Mind would resonate with people like you and other people. Well, Blue Mind resonates with people like me because it's something that we innately feel and know and understand. To have somebody explain it scientifically um, in terms of neuroscience, in terms of the body, in terms of change, and in terms of emotion, gives an explanation to what we already feel. Those of us who are perhaps connected to the oceans on many levels, not just because we go for a swim, for me it's been a part of my life, instinctually know that what Jay is explaining is real. But it is really important for somebody like Jay to be able to take that forward and actually dissect it, to be able to explain what happens in your brain when you touch water what happens in your body, in your body temperature, and all of, on all levels. Because I do feel like most people need an explanation. And Jay can do that. You know, it's funny, most people, they don't really think about it. Like, they, they realize they feel better, but when somebody actually breaks it down mm. and explains the science, they're like, oh, I get it. And I think they even enjoy it a little bit more. Uh, because you sort of run through, you know, yes, this is not your imagination. This is actually a physical response to water. Tell me how you think other people can, can add water to their life. Well, I think first of all, a lot of people when they go on holiday, they choose to go by the seaside. And that, that draw has all of this behind it. And as you said, people s feel or they sense when they're in the water, God, I feel so good. It's not just because you're on vacation, it's because you are near water, it's because you're in water. I think a way that a lot of people could do that, if they have the privilege of traveling, is to spend time near the ocean, near a lake, near a, a river, whatever body of water they can get to, um, because it's re-energizing. And I, I call travel a privilege, because it isn't given to everybody to either have the, the financial or time ability to do it. So maybe go for a drive on the weekend. I live in the countryside, and one thing we love to do is go for a walk in the woods, and it's always better when there's a stream a little bit of a river trickling through. So I would recommend to people to, to get near water as much as possible. I think it's a healing source. You don't have to go swimming with sharks. You don't have to go in the deep ocean to get that. I think even being near it is enough. And another way to do it if you can't get near a body of water, and, and this is my sort of nonprofit mind, is to support organizations that are protecting 
um, water environments that are protecting oceans because it's for the betterment of all of us that these these ocean ecosystems are healthy. Also, Jay's other sort of you know passion project is turtles. Yeah, he's just a turtle fanatic. Who doesn't love turtles? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, you know, you see the little babies hatching and you know striving towards yeah. the ocean. It's just just beautiful. Can you talk about his his turtle mission a little bit? I probably can't talk about it as well as some other um, people can, but I do. I feel like what Jay is doing with turtle protection and release is really important. It's a very symbolic um, project for people to be able to understand, mm. here is a species that needs our help. We've destroyed habitat and we can do something about it. When you have something simple that is cause and effect, it gives people the notion and the ability to get involved. And I think that's really important to do. My own son, we talk about eliminating single-use plastics. We go to a restaurant and I'll order apple juice in a glass, no straw, thank you. And then he turns to the waitress, he goes, yeah, because it goes up a turtle's nose. Because he's seen the video, he's very aware. And I do feel that that's something else that we are responsible for as parents, is to educate our kids. They pick up on it so quickly. It was so simple for him to understand why it is that we're trying to eliminate single-use plastic because he saw, he said it hurts a turtle. Does anything stand out where you had like sort of a moment of awe under the water? Where you saw something oh, yeah. that just kind of, <laughs> like it's one, like one particular story that was yeah. kind of, you know, almost spiritual in nature. I was off of the coast of Australia filming um, a show about sharks. We were working with different scientists and they were catching and tagging sharks to understand where they roamed so that we could better protect their ecosystem and not just the species. We were up in Rain Island, where green turtles lay their eggs, because we wanted to film tiger sharks. And so green turtles are easy prey once they come off land. So we were there to film and catch and tag tiger sharks. Um, when we were done with the whole filming side of things, we had one hour of time for just a recreational dive, which rarely happens when you're on a shoot filming in the oceans. Typically, you're just working. So we, we all went down and we put our backs up against the reef and you start making noise actually, sorry to say, with a plastic bottle because it sounds like a fish in distress. And what we were trying to do is attract sharks coming in. And soon enough, like about 30 seconds later, the ocean went silent. The little fish stopped eating on the coral. There was just this deafening silence and we're like, oh my God, where is it? And sure enough, just about five meters from us, this massive tiger shark swims by and just you can see its eye kind of scanning us and then keeps swimming. And I think we all stopped breathing in that moment of just watching this majestic animal swim by and hearing the entire ecosystem adapt to its presence. And then as soon as it was out of sight, you started hearing all the little fish starting to eat on the coral again. I don't know, it was, it, it's just such an amazing moment to be in the presence of such a majestic animal underwater. and. Um, be allowed it to be there. That is amazing. I mean, because you know, you're above water, the water's beautiful, it's, you know, it's blue. You don't realize the sort of the majesty and the wonder that's going on underneath. They're there living their lives when we're there or not. Um, to be a witness to it is a privilege. Have you ever seen anything that was particularly heartbreaking underwater? We were filming in American Samoa and uh, they had been used to using dynamite for fishing. And uh, so we were filming in this one bay that had since been protected and was slowly, slowly starting to recuperate. But basically they had dynamited the entire coral reef. And that's pretty heartbreaking when you, when you realize how quickly you can destroy something and how slowly it grows back when it comes to corals. It was hard to see. But the good side of the story is that this bay is now protected and bit by bit it's recuperating. But again, that goes back to education. It goes back to understanding if, if you want to keep fishing, dynamite's not the best way to go <laughs> because you're destroying the entire ecosystem on which the fish live and on which you depend. So protecting that bay actually will hopefully allow the bay to recuperate, allow the fish population to come back and maybe even allow them to fish sustainably. You're an extraordinary woman. I, I'm just very impressed with you, but you yeah. seem to be, you know, you seem to have dedicated your life to either helping the oceans, helping indigenous people, um, educating, mm -hmm. advocating. You know, what? at what point in your life did you sort of wake up and say, you know what, this is my mission, this is my personal mission. You know, your family is sort of a big name, mm -hmm. but you've taken upon yourself to go even further. 
I've always been connected to the environment, um, partially through my family's work, but also just because it was a natural place for me to be. I started working on documentaries in 2006 when my father was doing a series for PBS called Ocean Adventures. At the time, I was guiding biking and hiking trips. I was finishing my master's degree. I don't know how, but I had some spare time. And so I offered my help um, on the production, doing logistics. I ended up following the gray whale migration um, all the way up to Barrow, Alaska. And I was looking out, and this is kind of a final moment in a sequence of moments of going, God, I love this. I love being out in the world, I, you know. But I was up um, in Barrow, Alaska, and, you know, Arctic Sea on one side, the tundra on the other. And I went, this is what I want to do. I want to keep doing this. I want to keep going out into the world and meeting incredible people and cultures and animals and bringing those stories back. But I brought with me everything I had done up until that point. I studied psychology in my undergraduate degree because I wanted to understand the human mind. Why do we behave the way that we do? How do we shift our behaviors? How do we understand people? I studied intercultural relations in my master's because I wanted to understand how we work across cultures. How can we better communicate? Not just in terms of culture and language, but in terms of sectors of society. Bringing all of that with me and then in this moment, one of many, looking out into the environment and saying, I want to bring back stories was about connecting people to the environment. It was about making a full circle back from understanding human beings in the context of nature. And how is it that we can keep making those connections for people to understand you are one integral and one small integral part of everything that happens on this planet. But in order to understand that, you need to be inspired and you need to be, you need to be in a way connected with what happens everywhere. That's kind of what has continued inspiring me. I feel like I, um, I have tremendous energy to give. I have a passion for what I do. I have a privilege that I wake up every morning with purpose. I want to be able to share that. To just keep that for myself um, isn't, isn't enough. And, um, and being able to actually help others in the process is rewarding for me. There have been studies done on, on you know, philanthropy, people who give. Well, they always feel good when they give. Well, this is my way of doing it. You've got a child at home, you yeah. know, you're married, you, you know, it's very complicated. There are a lot of moving pe you know, pieces here. You could sort of stay and farm your land here and <laughs> bake bread and be really I tried happy. planting beets and carrots. I failed miserably. <laughs> I can do basil and thyme. <laughs> um, I, I could do other things. Of course I can do other things, but I have no desire to. And, and living a way that might be easier, uh, I can't imagine it. That would last a couple of weeks. It's difficult to juggle everything, and some days are harder than others. I'm not one to pretend that it's all optimistic and it's all beautiful. There are some days I wake up and I, I don't want to care because caring is harder. It's, it's harder to be passionate about something. It's harder to care so much about something that you're completely involved in it. But how can you not? I mean, once you know something exists, once you've been a witness to it, and you know that you have the power to support and help and create change, why would you not? I can sit comfortably and have tea from 9 to 10 a.m. And then it's time to get back to work. And there are days that I don't. There are days that I just, you know what, I'm going to go watch my son and play soccer and that's enough because it is also about creating balance. And I think that's something that in, in the nonprofit world, in the cause-focused world, in the defenders and the warriors of the planet, too often we don't take care of ourselves, is that we're constantly on this defend everything else. So I have my sacred moments. I have my yoga class Tuesdays and Thursdays from noon to one, and there's nothing that's going to interrupt that. Because if I don't have that, I don't have balance. So I think those moments need to exist. So, I mean, have there been, I mean, you were invited by indigenous tribes to come and tell their story. Mm -hmm. They chose you as a voice. It's really heavy. I mean, oh, yeah. that's kind of massive if you think about it. I mean, because part of their survival depends upon you being able to tell the world why they're important, why they need to be there. I mean, can you talk about the responsibility of that and sure. how that makes you feel? Um, so the indigenous tribes um, in the Valle do Javari, uh, in the Brazilian Amazon, asked me to tell their story. I met them in 2007, um, working on a film called Return to the Amazon, which is going back to places my grandfather had been to in the early 80s. So from 2007 to 2010, um, I had actually tried to put together a project to support these tribes who have an 80% hepatitis rate, hepatitis A, B, C, and Delta, which are diseases brought in by outsiders. It's not something that's um, natural to them. So they don't have the medicine of their own traditional plants. 
2008, um, I realized that by myself, far away, I couldn't solve this problem. And I had to let the project go. And in that moment, I felt like I was letting 5,000 people down, which is heavy. It's difficult. Two years later, I get an email from one of the indigenous people I had met. Um, and people say, what, an email? <laughs> well, there's a border town near their territory. And they love Facebook, by the way. And he sent me an email and he said, Celine, we want you to tell the world our real story. Other people come here and they talk about our hunting, our gathering, our cultural ways, you know, our shamans. Um, they don't talk about the fact that we're going extinct. And that's what we need them to know. So I said yes. I didn't really know what I was getting into at the moment. Um, that was 2010, it's now 2018. And I have a 92 minute film, which does tell the difficult story. Um, and it tells my story in parallel with theirs. In order to, for the audience to be engaged in what they're doing, I'm, I'm the bridge, I'm the connector. The weight that I carry in being uh, partially responsible for telling their story is manageable. And I feel that if you are asked for help and you say yes, you follow through. I wake up every morning, I turn the water on, I have clean water. I go to my local co-op and I have organic food. My kid goes to private school. We're privileged. We have a roof over our head, we have clean food, clean water, um, access to, in the United States, sorry to say, mediocre healthcare. We are privileged in that we have all our needs met. So why wouldn't I fight? Why wouldn't I keep supporting people who ask me for help? Telling the story isn't enough because a documentary film that I'm making will help tell the story, but it isn't going to save their lives. And that's something I learned from them. I had gone to the Peruvian Amazon, worked with different tribes there, asked to make a film, and they said, do you really think this film is gonna change our lives? He goes, the people that are gonna watch it are gonna feel sorry for us, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna go to sleep, and they're not gonna do anything, and we will continue our struggles. He says, so your film won't make change happen. And it, it's tough to hear, but it's important because it's true. It might change the way some people view the world. It might change the way they see their connection with indigenous people as caretakers of the Amazon. And the Amazon is an ecosystem on which we all depend for the air that we breathe, for biodiversity, for potential resources to pharmaceuticals. But is watching a film gonna help them survive? Is caring about them gonna help them survive? No. Defending them is gonna help them survive creating change, creating legislature that protects them, bringing proper health care. That's what's going to help. So attached to the documentary film is an impact campaign which includes education, advocacy and activism. And that's what I encourage people to do. Tell the story and then do something. Tell the story and point people in the right direction. Support an organization. Stop using timber that is illegally harvested. Think about indigenous people connected to you because 4% of the global population are indigenous tribes. They protect 80% of biodiversity on this planet. It's a really good investment. So invest in people to protect land, to protect biodiversity. So going from just telling a story to the activism side is really, um, it's a big learning curve, but it's necessary. Well, I mean, you talk about the sort of the, reper the personal return on all of this effort, mm. you know, how it makes you feel, you know, how when you look back on what you've done, you know, the impact that you've had on other people, you know, why should other people also do things like the projects that you're doing? First of all, I feel people need to choose what their cause is. They have to believe in it. They have to be passionate about it. I don't think that every person can do everything. Pick a cause. What matters to you? It doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be far away and exotic. It can be very local. It can be people. It can be wildlife. It can be ecosystems. But, but do something about it. Just take a step forward. We have now access to more information than we ever have. Mm -hmm. There is no excuse for not understanding what our options are. And you can just type online, what can I do about? Who can I support? Who's defending this? I just encourage people to do a bit of research and then to actually get involved in something. It's great to care. I fully support people caring. But following through to taking action is more important. Stop single-use plastics. Eat sustainable food. Try to eat organic if you can afford it. Support organizations that um, work on causes you believe in. Homeless dogs, people in the Amazon, whatever it is, I think that we all have to work together for it to work. You know, you, you've mentioned a couple of times connectivity. Mm. You know, how we're all connected through the air, through the ocean, through, you know, information. You know, somebody in the rainforest, well, he's, 
he's taking care of the local plants that help us all. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how we're all connected and sort of weave that into like why we need to wake up and care? I mean, I just yeah. feel like so many of us are walking around in a coma. I think sometimes for most people, it's easier to walk around in a coma. This notion of, of not knowing protects your mind, it protects yourself from being exposed to truth and knowledge. A friend of mine who is also a filmmaker in, in asking me what my purpose with all of my work was, pointed out to me. He said, you know, Celine, what you're trying to do is you're trying to shift human consciousness. And that's not necessarily tangible. So when I'm asked, you know, what my purpose is or how can I connect people to other people, other ecosystems, or what's going on on the planet, it is, a, it is about our consciousness. It is about our mind. It is about giving small anecdotes, allowing people to understand um, the ecosystems that we depend on. Oxygen is a very simple way. You know, we started with that. 50% of our oxygen comes from oceans, 50% comes from plants. That right there is reason enough to start thinking, maybe there are places and people that could use my help. Because without us doing anything, nature is giving us a service. And in the case of the tribes that I work with, where there are indigenous tribes in the Amazon, there's no deforestation. If there's no deforestation, that's helping mitigate climate change and helping provide oxygen. All it takes is an iota of, I guess, open-mindedness to think, okay, why are turtles important? Well, it's not just the turtle that's important. It's, it's the entire chain of events that happens if that one species disappears. Why are sharks important? Well, they're top predators in the ocean. They clean the ocean ecosystem of the diseased and dying fish. They're actually pretty lazy creatures. They want easy feed. So if you have these ocean predators there, you have an entire ecosystem that is healthy. So that's why protecting sharks is important. Why is it important to protect coral reefs? Well, coral reefs provide an entire ecosystem for all of these different other animals on the coral reef system, which frankly is good for local economy mm -hmm. because you have snorkelers and divers that come. So if that ocean ecosystem is not protected, the economy is not healthy. I think anything you look at, you can start connecting it back to humans, right? And, and you can start, you can sit me in front of a banker and I can tell a banker why an ecosystem is important to them if what's important to that banker is the economy. Same thing with real estate developers or the tourism industry. So I think what's important is I can't do the work for everybody. And I think what's important is that each individual person needs to start seeing what we're talking about and start understanding their connection as well. Um, I can't keep handing things on a silver platter. I feel like we, we need to do a bit of the work ourselves each individual. So what are you most excited about working on next? I would love to see my own film, Tribes on the Edge, complete mm -hmm. and distributed, wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see the impact campaign actually creating change for the people that I am working for in the Amazon. I'm excited to be working on a series for French television. Uh, we shot one episode in Patagonia. We're shooting a second episode in the Red Sea a third sometime in the spring. And hopefully if that goes well, we have many more to go. You know, I don't know all the next projects. I know that there's quite a lot of them in the mix. I'm excited to keep telling stories and connecting people to keep inspiring people and doing good in the world in whatever form it takes. We were in India working on an elephant rescue project. Next week I'm diving on a shipwreck. To me it all makes sense and it's part of the greater story that all of those things are connected. What are your hopes for the planet you know, what are your hopes for your son? Like what, what he can look forward to enjoying in the future? My hopes for my son uh, in the next generation is that when they are teenagers, when they are in their 20s, they can look back and say, yeah, our parents did something good. And that they will look back on some of the incredibly unthoughtful things that have been done and say, well, I'm glad that's over. I think that there's, there's a lot of change happening now I feel like the next generation will have a period of adaptation to a lot of changes in our environment. I think that the next generation will be able to adapt. I'm worried about the one after. You know, thinking about two generations from now is a little bit more holistic in the way we should think. And again, that's another lesson learned from an indigenous leader in the Amazon who said to my mother, so now we're talking across one more generation, he said, you see that tree over there? That's gonna make a good canoe for me today. He goes, but you see that little one right there that I just planted? 
He goes, that might make a good canoe for my grandson or maybe his son. That's it. That's, that's really what it is. That's going to serve my purpose today, but I'm planting that for my great-grandchild. And that's the way we need to think about everything. We used to do it. Indigenous people still do. We used to do it instinctually because it was the only way to survive, was to live in harmony and in balance with everything around us. We need to get back to that. I don't know, I've spoken at people at different levels. I sat on the World Economic Forum Council on Oceans <laughs> um, for four years and it taught me a lot about working, well, utilizing intercultural relations to work across sectors. You know, at one table we had somebody from World Wildlife Fund, Pew Trust, but then we had somebody from deep sea bed mining and, you know, massive fishing industry in China. And we were there to have a common conversation. And that's what needs to happen. So whether I'm speaking to a, a lay person about like why I'm not using plastic, we need to also be able to talk to a bank CEO about their responsibility and how they can inspire their clientele or shoot, choose clients more wisely. Yeah, we have to work across the board, otherwise we're not going to get there. And not every day is easy. I mean, I hope I don't make it sound, I don't ever want to make it sound like it's just a walk in the park because I don't think it is. I think that we have to, I think we have to be fierce. We have to be fierce in what we do and we have to deserve defending I and mean, that's what i felt with this project um, in the amazon is that i have been knocked down time and time again um, because the project is really difficult and i feel like it's only when i stand back up that i deserve to have been asked for help that my conviction has to be tested over and over again for me to say no i still believe in this you you, you can't stop me i still believe in this and i think we need more of that that's more the the, the sort of survival instinct that we um, that we're lacking because we've become lazy and lackadaisical in our lives. Um, I think we need to just, our spirit needs to be lit on fire a bit. Well, I told you that was a great conversation between Celine Cousteau and Sarah Sheehan. The Cousteau family is such a powerful legacy and they're leading the future of this conversation about our water planet. So share this Blue Mind story far and wide because everybody needs to get their blue mind on and get ready for the next episode.